This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Oh, hey, everyone. It's Mark Bayer, and you're listening to When Science Speaks. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists and engineers clearly communicate the real-world impact of their work to funders, policymakers, and the public using true-to-life training and communication and relationship building. I am so happy to have Harvey Seifter on the show today. Harvey is director and principal investigator at Art of Science Learning and the founder and managing director at Creating Futures at Work. The Art of Science Learning is a National Science Foundation funded initiative that uses the arts to spark creativity in science education and the development of an innovative 21st century STEM workforce. The initiative is built on more than 15 years of work by Harvey and his colleagues, exploring the impact of artistic skills, processes, and experiences on learning and the innovation process. Harvey is a real pioneer and leading authority in arts based learning, or uh, ABL. His comprehensive and independent report, which is called Arts-Based Learning, leads to improvements in creative thinking skills, collaborative behaviors, and innovation outcomes, resulted from his four-year NSF-funded effort to test the hypothesis that integrating the arts into STEM-related innovation training results in enhanced creative thinking skills, more robust collaborative processes, and stronger innovation outcomes. Harvey, along with his partners in the arts and sciences, convened roundtables and symposia with hundreds of science educators, classroom teachers, museum professors, and other stakeholders which have revealed a broadly shared belief in the connection between the investigative nature of science and the arts and an appreciation for the potential of arts-based learning to foster passion for exploration and discovery in young learners. Harvey's work has documented a broad consensus that the thoughtful integration of ABL into science education has the potential to make the study of science more attractive and inspiring to students, enhance the scientific literacy of the American people, and strengthen creativity and innovation skills across the American workforce. Welcome to the show, Harvey, and thank you so much for being here. Mark, thanks for having me. This is a, a really wonderful uh, series that you have, and it's, it's very exciting to be part of it. Well, thanks. And you're bringing to this uh, just a fascinating dimension. So I want to get right to it. You know, I've always been interested personally in etymology. And you know, when I do my talks or my workshops, I sometimes include the fact that the the word scientist is a relatively new term and, you know, dating back to 1834. And it's actually from the Latin scientia, you know, knowledge, people know that. And then the, 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 the stuff is the end of the second piece really is from artist. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that really drew me to talking with you because of, of the amazing work that, that you're doing. And, you know, I'm going to ask you about in a moment, but I want to start with sort of what first led you to this hypothesis that incorporating arts-based learning could spark interest in science and drive innovation and encourage collaboration in adults? Well, the, the, the etymology is actually a great way to get there because, you know, 500 years ago, uh, nobody would have actually recognized the difference between an artist and a scientist, even if uh, the word scientist had existed at that time. The concept of, of that differentiation would have not made any real sense. I think of art and science as, as different ways of knowing and experiencing the world, and yet that share so many common common tools, common uh, uh, points of view and perspectives. Uh, and it always seemed to me that the division between the two is kind of kind of unnatural and artificial. Um, when, when I was a kid, I was passionately engaged by both art and science. Uh, music was my first language. I learned to read it before English. I was a classically trained uh, uh, musician, uh, violinist. But um, I also grew up with a tremendous passion for science and, and spent my summers doing uh, research in a renal immunology lab. 
And uh, one of the things that struck me <laughs> tremendously was that the, 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 the senior researchers, the principal investigator of the lab and the other senior researchers, most of them were really uh, extraordinarily gifted and accomplished musicians. Mm -hmm. And occasionally when one of the, they, they had a string quartet. Occasionally when one of them was traveling, I would get to sit in, sit in as a, a second violinist and play. <laughs> and uh, it, it just, from the very beginning, they, it always seemed to me that these are, 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 are two pursuits that are grounded on perception and really refining and learning how to how to how to uh, collect information by what we hear what we see and then beyond the observation um, experimentation and the mm -hmm. uh, the openness to new ideas and the uh, insistence that those ideas be put through the rigor of testing and experimentation and learning and growth wow yep a absolutely so, Go ahead. I mean, so, so with that with that common background, um, the connection to science is kind of kind of obvious. The connection to um, innovation, I think, grew just very naturally out of my years uh, in running theater companies and looking working with 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 groups of artists from many different disciplines uh, that were working under extraordinary constraints uh, and that nonetheless were constantly inventing remarkable and powerful new new uh, products new 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 services new ways of seeing the world and uh, it, it it just seemed to me that they were a natural mix the collaboration was um something that came to me a bit later though mm. in that um i always saw uh the ways that collaboration could benefit artistic pursuits, it never actually really occurred to me how much artistic pursuits could do to foster collaboration until the years that I spent as part of Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, not as part of the, the orchestra as a player, but as its uh, director, and working with that conductorless process and realizing that uh, there were in incredible ways to learn and get inside of and understand and, and power high performance teamwork by working with the arts. You know, it's so funny because as you're describing that, Harvey, I'm thinking about like a lab and the PI or, you know, a, a, a group, you know, in, a, in an academic setting, whether it's industry or academia or el elsewhere. And, and I'm thinking about that conductor that you're talking about in the orchestral setting. Well, so it's, it's, it's really interesting because um, the, the, when you think about um, a PI on a complex project, they have some clearly defined leadership responsibilities, and yet in so many ways, uh, being a successful PI means um, being able to, to define their leadership largely in terms of what they're able to empower and enable others to do, mm -hmm. to, to help their teams to realize their, their full uh, potential and possibilities. Uh, I always used to say at, at, at Orpheus, my role there as the CEO of a multi-leadered organization was to be the, 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 the decision maker of last resort, the final arbiter. But I could measure my success in doing that in inverse proportion to the number of decisions I actually had to make. <laughs> And I think that that it, so so much of, of the way that teams actually work at the edge of innovation, at the edge of knowledge, and at the edge of, 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 of an increasingly volatile and complex world resides in this whole idea of multi-leader teams and teams where everybody is a leader and everybody is a follower. One of the great learnings of that is, is, is that without followers, there are no leaders. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, we it, when when teams are able to work in that way, uh, they can make extraordinary music and they can discover extraordinary things about the world around them. That's uh, what 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 I've always admired the most, both in music and in scientific enterprises. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to ask whether your work it currently includes in its scope sort of what's happening neurologically you know, to trigger this, this kind of behavior, whether there are any theories at this point, you know, about, you know, whether it's while a conductor is, 
is working with an orchestra or a, a PI or other leaders within a, a group are working on a project, something new, whether there are any similarities about maybe even brain location or what, what parts of the brain are most active and are there similarities between those areas of activity? One of the things that I find most fascinating is the correlation that's emerged uh, between different types of artistic experiences. And by that I mean um, passive experiences and looking at art or listening to music or in some way engaging on that level and active experiences of actually making or creating mm-hmm. art. But the correlation in brain activity between what happens when those things are going on and when we experience empathy. There was a fascinating uh, study by uh, James Catterall, uh, 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 a really wonderful um, arts education researcher who's sadly no longer with us. But James, um, well, first he wrote a book uh, called Doing Well by Doing Good by Doing Art. It was a longitudinal study uh, that he conducted that looked at, at, at at teenagers that were involved with the arts, teenagers that weren't, um, and and then where they found themselves in life some years later, I believe it was 15 years later as adults. Um, and one of the key conclusions that he came to was that the, the kids who <laughs> then grew up, who had been involved with, with, with the arts, were showing better outcomes in a number of ways, even when controlled for all the factors that you would think would be mm-hmm. important. Um, and that that uh, that seemed to have a great deal to do with the fact that um, they, 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 were, they had a highly developed sense of altruism and they did things for other people. And in the process of doing things for other people, they developed... Um, all kinds of social capital mm-hmm. and that social capital was directly related to how the ways in which they were doing better as adults. So the suggestion that, that, that engaging in the arts as an adolescent has these lifelong benefits and that it has something to do with building the ability or the desire or the skills to do that. Um, so taking that as a point of departure, he did a meta study where he looked at, at, 39 neuroimaging studies that were done over a period of 20 years. Mm -hmm. And um, roughly half of those studies were uh, looked at the brain uh, when it was in some way involved with art making or art experiencing. The other half looked at at the brain when it was experiencing empathy. And and there were so many neural substrates that were shared. Mm. between the, the, the art experiences and empathy that uh, it strongly suggests that something about making art and experiencing art triggers responses in the empathic circuitry of the brain mm-hmm. that, uh, that make a difference and that perhaps relate to back to that study that that looked at the long-term impacts on kids now in terms of of our own work we looked at at at, at, a, at a small slice of that but we looked very carefully at it in an experimental study that we did and uh we we took a group of of early career scientists scientists engineers stem professionals and uh we we worked with them under controlled conditions for five weeks, a 20 hour period over over a five week span. Mm -hmm. And in that time, uh, we had teams of eight people uh, work on innovation projects. And these were innovation projects that were specifically around water resources. And this was conducted in San Diego and it was done uh, at the height of the drought there. So it was very much a, a community concern and focus. And we actually did a year long project with our incubator in San Diego on, on, on that same theme. Wow. Mm-hmm. But, um, but in this particular study, it was 20 hours. The control group used uh, a, a, a project based innovation curriculum based on best practices that were developed from the Product Development Management Association and uh, were taught by, by, by excellent instructors. And the treatment group used the same basic methodology 
but scooped out nine of the 20 hours uh, of more traditional kinds of cognitive training and replaced it with nine hours of arts-based learning. Mm -hmm. So for nine of those 20 hours, all of these scientists were, were advancing their innovation projects in different ways using music and drawing and sculpture and various art forms. And what we saw in the outcomes was, was, was really striking. And we, we had trained observers watch the teams, all of these teams, uh, constantly during that period. And they were, coded and recorded all of the behaviors that they saw. We looked at 11 behaviors of, 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 of collaboration. Uh, many of them included in things like empathic listening, and trust and mutual respect, transparency, uh, emotionally intelligent behavior, mm -hmm. things of that nature. And uh, the, the, the control and treatment groups started off in roughly the same place, naturally. Uh, and they both got better over time in that the more you practice collaboration, the better you get at it. But the, um, the, the treatment groups, after about the third week, they started to soar. And actually, interestingly, it was about around the third week where the challenges that the teams were facing were growing more severe, more, more, more difficult to, 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 to deal with. The stress mm -hmm. was more severe. And yet we were seeing more and more of these behaviors uh, of collaboration from these teams. Now, the control teams, they kind of flattened out. In some cases, the, the behaviors actually got worse as they were faced with, 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 with stiffer challenges. So there's a suggestion in, in the laboratory as well that what's suggested by the, the, the neuroimaging studies plays out in real life, that, that we, we, we see that as, as people work with the arts, it seems to bring out and foster collaborative, emotionally intelligent behaviors that are grounded powerfully in empathy. And so I, I think that one of the most important things that arts-based learning brings to, to science, but to all kinds of human pursuit, mm -hmm. is it brings this, this, these traits of empathy, the behaviors of empathy, the openness, the willingness to, to, to suspend disbelief in the other person, uh, the trust, the mutual respect, all of these things. And of course, those are just remarkable spurs to, 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 to creativity, to knowledge development, and to happiness and well-being. Absolutely. You know, I just love this, fascinated by it. And you know, my, my experience almost, you know, suggests that it's almost like the, the individuals involved aren't even aware this is happening. Yes. Um, and to, <laughs> and so you sort of, when I'm, you know, I'm talking about, and we're going to get to this in, in a minute, but you know, the, the, the logic channel, so to speak, um, is just sort of one of the channels in which we're communicating on. And the emotional channel is one that I emphasize a lot with scientists um, partly because it's you know, partly because it's so important, and the other sort of part is because it's not one on which you're used to broadcasting or particularly like to broadcast on or comfortable broadcasting on. Um, but this, I kind of put this art experience or participation kind of on in in that within that mutual uh, within that emotional channel, if even you know of the same wavelength. Absolutely. So I think that, um, broadly speaking, there are two approaches that, that people tend to take in life if they want to improve their communications. And this isn't to say that, that, that it's a black and white picture, that one is good and the other isn't. But one approach is to look at the, the, the technical skills and, and, and faculties and attributes of, of, of good communication and to, to learn those, to master those. The other is to go to the source of passion, power, and emotional engagement and find ways to bring that to life mm -hmm. and then engage it in your communication. Mm -hmm. So we obviously... We all need both. It's sort of like one of those those questions of should acting be outside in or inside out? But uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> but but when it comes to, to to working with scientists who already are pretty highly developed in the level of technical uh, 
thinking and skill development and systematic approaches to things. Mm -hmm. um, adding this 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 affective piece, and it, it not only as a technique for delivery, but as a way of engaging the inner passions that we all carry in us mm -hmm. in ways that will really bring communication to life. You know, there 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 are some wonderful studies that that show what happened. Uh, inside the brain when it's when a story is told mm -hmm. and the kinds of, of mirroring that goes on and it not only goes from the storyteller to the listener but the ways that it's then reflected back to the storyteller as the the person who's telling the story sees the impact that they're having on their audience mm -hmm. and sees the the body language and and, and 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 reads those signals that are coming out and so what happens is that you're it's not just that you're effectively engaging somebody else and, and conveying what you want to, you're actually learning a tremendous amount also, and you're bringing something very close to a mind mill together. And as, as we do that, we're forging the basis for collaboration, we're forming the basis for social cohesion, and ultimately, we're forming the basis for, for the kinds of, of shared exploration and investigation that lead to, to, to it's a powerful outcome. You know, it reminds me of a couple of things. It is one, you know, when I worked on Capitol Hill, we were advocating for increased funding for Alzheimer's research. And I mean, all of the arguments as to why that was important, more money for NIH, critical. If we don't, if we don't uh, treat, we don't solve, we don't cure Alzheimer's in some way. The amount of money spent to do that for caring for people with Alzheimer's, you know, by 2040 is going to approach the amount of money that we're spending on the entire defense budget, which is mind boggling, right? Wow. And so you can make all the arguments, I can give you analogies, I can do this. But one thing we did is we did a concert. We did a concert with Glenn Campbell, who at the time, country star right. Glenn Campbell, you know, uh, right. huge uh, recording star, particularly in the 70s and maybe right. early 80s as well, um, beloved to a whole group of, of folks around the world. And he was, suffering. yes, exactly. <laughs> and he, uh, he had Alzheimer's. He was dealing with Alzheimer's. And so he did his goodbye tour. And we had one of those stops was at the Library of Congress. We created this venue for him. And we invited all the members of Congress uh, to attend. And, you know, we had members uh, of Congress who were responsible for appropriations. And even those that were responsible for being the chair, you know, were the chair of the committee determining how much money the NIH got. Yep. And, you know, it, when we were talking, it reminded me a lot of how we were reaching out to this group um, through art. Um, yep. And of course, you know, it was just one of the channels that we were broadcasting on. Uh, the other just thing I, I wanted to mention quickly and get your reaction to, you know, some of this reminded me of that great monologue by uh, James Earl Jones during, um, during, um, uh, one sec, we'll have to pause here for a sec. Um, you know, if you, if, if you build it, they, they will come. It feel the dreams. Yep. Yeah. Remind, so part of this reminds me of that great James Earl Jones monologue in Field of Dreams, which he basically tells Roy Kinsella, you know, Ray Kinsella, um, that he needs to build this field and people will come from all over Ray and they'll gladly hand over $20 and they'll remember, you know, they'll remember their own experiences with baseball, which I'd argue is an art form. And they will, you know, they'll find a seat by the first base and third base lines. And, you know, it's like they'll be transported back. Uh, in, in a way that really is touching them, the experience really touching them in a completely different way than just say talking about baseball or, or going through the stats and facts sure. about baseball. When we actually, when we actually make things with our hands or with our bodies, as well as with our minds, we learn at such deep levels. We change what we do and who we are, and and. And it sticks and it stays. Mm -hmm. So you know, when I think of think of, uh, of that, I think of so much of the work that we've done with with community innovation. I think that one of the powerful things that the arts bring is a set of universal 
learning and building tools. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it sounds, when you say it, it sounds kind of funny, but I think it's true. It's, it's, it's kind of what I've distilled out of, out of my years of working as, as an educator for the arts, that you can teach almost anyone almost anything with almost any art form if you do it right. Mm -hmm. And doing it right means give people a chance to actually get their hands on it, get, as well as their minds around it, and to, to, to work with it because the process of working teaches us things. We usually think that, that, that what we have to do is we have to, to learn how to, how to make things. But what we actually do here is we make things and that becomes the source of our learning. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it, because this is a kind of a universal alphabet of creative expression and because learning and, and, and innovation are so joined at the hip that when we work with, with, with arts-based learning and innovation, we are suddenly in a domain where scientists and non-scientists can not only talk to each other, but they can co-create. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the, the kinds of learning that, that become possible uh, are just breathtaking to experience. You know, I, I just love it. And it, it's also reminiscent to me of, of some of the incubators that are popping up at various universities where they have, you know, for example, I'm thinking about Vanderbilt has a has a incubator called the Wondry, and I've I've interviewed uh, a leader at that uh, at Vanderbilt in the previous episode. And you know, you have everyone from undergrads to postdocs and all everyone in between, sort of working together as a on on teams, you know, for a particular project or service that they want to to develop and innovative innovate around. And um, that you're suggesting that you know the the process of doing that. Uh, in, in, in and of itself is a learning outcome, just regardless of whether the product or service is marketed, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. We had, we had uh, uh, incubators in, in, in three cities across the country, mm -hmm. in Diego and Chicago and Worcester, Massachusetts. And in these incubators, we worked with a staggering diversity and array of people from so many different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the youngest person in, in the incubator was 14. He was, it, it was, uh, he was supposed to be 16 and older. We learned uh, uh, about eight months into it that he had lied about his age. To <laughs> uh, the, the oldest that we had was around 85. Wow. Uh, we had artists, scientists, business people, we had retirees. We had uh, uh, university professors. We had uh, 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 we had a CEO. We had uh, uh, a couple of deans of universities. Uh, we had undergraduate students and high school students, and just you know, from all architects and people from all different kinds of backgrounds. Mm. Um, and they were coming together out of this shared passion for uh, innovation to address the civic challenges that, that were in their communities. And as, as I mentioned earlier, water resources in San Diego and, and urban nutrition in Chicago, transportation mm -hmm. in Worcester. And the, so much of what they learned in doing it, and they learned tremendous amounts, came just from this, the, this experience of collaborating across every, every, every boundary that normally silos people and walls mm -hmm. them off from one another. And um, they showed extraordinary resilience. They were able to, in the end, uh, we had, I think, 29 teams, and 22 of them actually went to market with, uh, wow. uh, with uh, uh, at least minimum viable products of mm -hmm. new products, services, and so forth. And five years later, two of them are actually in business as going concerns. One is a thriving not-for-profit uh, that, that has done amazing things uh, in, in, in Worcester with transportation. One of them is a commercial enterprise that, that has developed a, uh, a new uh, uh, support system for pollinators and, and sells them and, and installs them in sites all across the country. Wow. So seeing these things unleashed, um, what one of the things that they had in common is that they were not domain experts. Even those who, who were, they were, there were small minorities of teams. Um, so they had to go out and find domain expertise to, to, to deal with some of the specialized issues. Mm -hmm. that they were, right? But they also had to find things in their own experience, in the community, 
uh, and in each other. That they were able to surface and work in a in, in, in a, an extraordinarily disciplined way through the many iterations of the incubator years and, and into the innovations. And of course, what was distinctive beyond that that structure was that um, for all the work that they put in and, and to to visualize the passion, these three hundred. Art of Science Learning Fellows devoted um, 100, in some cases, 200 hours over the course of a year mm -hmm. to, 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 the, to this work. Um, but through all of that process and all of the, sometimes the, 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 the frustrations that they experienced uh, in, in, in dealing with the challenges of it, they persevered, they developed levels of resilience, they used the arts to learn every step of this innovation process. But the focus of the innovation was that the, the arts weren't the object of it. Mm -hmm. They were essentially the tools that were being used to bring scientists and engineers and artists and community leaders and residents and students and teachers all together to create these new worlds. Wow, just, just fantastic. And I actually, I want to I wanna shift gears just a little bit to ask you about another topic that is really very much front and center in our society at this point, public policy and beyond. So, you know, we're, we're in a situation, we're in an environment now where, you know, the denial of facts and evidence about whether it's global warming, measles vaccination, genetically modified food, for example, um, that sort of rejection of evidence has become much more widespread, I would suggest. And, you know, the, today we call it alternative facts, you know, in the past, you know, we've called it by other, other terms, but they're really eroding respect for science um, and depleting the power of conclusions based on sound science in many, many places, even at the highest levels of, of U.S. government. And so how to combat alternative facts and, and push back on the assault on facts, it, it, those are passions of mine. I do a lot of talking and speaking about those, those issues. And one of the fundamental principles I teach scientists in this area is that facts and data, you know, alone are not, are not, enough you know they're not antidotes to, to to alternative facts and and in fact they they make the virus of alternative facts even more resistant if you try to treat it with mm -hmm. with facts and data as we've sort of touched upon um you know my my main message is to connect before you communicate you know connection with individuals you know through a different route which is more characterized by emotion and shared values that's shown more promise in in short-circuiting the power of alternative facts and so i'm wondering if art which you know appeals as we've been discussing to perhaps a different dimension in fact in in, in our makeup in our cognition maybe if, if you will um, if art is an example of connection through emotion that could perhaps you know help in, in this you know kind of really really challenging problem of people holding fast to things that are just you know not true so I think you've I think you've raised a really incredibly important set of questions. And there's, there are few things more troubling in the world than the, the, than the retreat from, from facts and the evidence-based investigation and from reason that we see in so many aspects of life mm -hmm. and which is accelerated, but it's, it's, it's not new. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, at least the last generation that, right. that, that that's been going on. So um, there's no question that art has enormous power to engage people emotionally. Um, and that the power of emotion is, 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 is critical. Um, I think that the things that you talk about and that you, teach and develop uh, around science communication and, and other initiatives like that are incredibly important because scientists are not necessarily at home in that world or it's not their default uh, uh, place to go and as they look to, to engage the public if they look to engage the public. Mm -hmm. I mean that said the, the whole the whole field has come a long way in the last you know half dozen years, mm -hmm. ten years. Right. And so it's 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 thanks to, to your efforts and other good efforts, uh, we're much further forward, but there's a long way to go. But beyond that, um, 
so or maybe the the, the limitation or the or, or, or the, the problem we're very well attuned to being manipulated by artistic expressions. We're becoming increasingly sophisticated at filtering out the signals that we don't want to see and hear. Mm -hmm. uh, and so while using emotion and using art to tell our stories and make our points is incredibly important, it's absolutely necessary, I don't think it will be sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the only force that I know that is even more powerful than those manipulations for good or bad uh, is the power of actual experience. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent that art gives us the possibility to actually begin to discover things for ourselves and to find evidence for ourselves and even tools to weigh it and consider it as well as tools to help us contextualize it maybe in ways that may be a little less threatening than some of the forces that cause so many of us to block out the facts that are inconvenient and uncomfortable right. um, I, I think that there, I think there's a great, there's a great opportunity there. What I've seen is that, that, that people that work with art in a purposeful way, um, they, they actually learn to see the world and, and perceive the world more carefully, more of it, more accurately. And they also become more open to suspending their disbelief in another person's mm -hmm. and that's a good place to start. If we can actually find ways to engage citizens, the people that ultimately have to decide in a society whether we're going to accept truths as truths. Uh, if we are able to give people tools where they can actually work at that and practice that and see that they're able to accomplish something which is useful in a frame of reference that, that, that they respect and understand, I think there may be opportunities there for them. Really helpful. Um, you know, it's, it's, as you point out, it's a very thorny problem to get to. And, and the, the power of art is one, as you suggest, is, as I feel like in a lot of ways, it's untapped in this kind of environment, this kind of um, climate. Um, I want to ask you, Harvey, you know, you've raised a number of things. Just in conclusion, you know, what's the best way for listeners uh, who are just, you know, as fascinated as, as I am uh, about ABL. How can they find out more about your work, about ABL, uh, maybe to incorporate into their curricula or programming or they want to get involved? Uh, yep. What can they do to, to learn more? So um, let me start with our website, or I should say websites. So artofsciencelearning.org is a kind of one-stop resource for many, many different things, including we have a comprehensive uh, open source arts-based innovation curriculum that has, I think, more than 100 hours of workshops posted there mm -hmm. uh, with pretty much complete instructions, which can be easily incorporated into things. There's a lot of research there. There are also lots of links to other researchers and other, other curricular resources and people that are working in this intersection of art, science, and learning. So that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good start. Um, I would also encourage people to go to the website of, uh, I think you mentioned uh, in the introduction, I also founded an organization uh, along with uh, my colleague, Fred Mandel, called Creating Futures That Work. Yes. And the focus of that organization is taking the, the, the uh, arts-based learning and the many resources that we've developed through the Art of Science Learning work over the years and bringing it to all kinds of, of, of settings in industry, in uh, 
in nonprofits, in organizations of different kinds. And so there are, there's information and resources there about how to connect this kind of work to organizational development and strengthening uh, innovation processes and all the different kinds of work we do uh, in fostering collaboration, resilience, empathy in the workplace. And uh, finally, there, I would encourage them to contact me directly with any questions or anything that they're interested in exploring further. And they can reach me through my email at, at, at either website. So it's hsifter, H-S-E-I-F-T-E-R, at artofsciencelearning.org. Well, that's great, Harvey. We're going to have all these resources available in the show notes as well. So great. listeners will be able to find them right on the website, right at bearstrategic.com. Go to the podcast tab, go to the episode, and you'll have all these and, and probably more listed and linked right there for you. Harvey Seifter, this has been just a fantastic episode. It's so eye-opening and, you know, frankly, optimistic. And it kind of reinforces something that we really are not hearing much about or seeing much in society right now, which is the similarities of, of, of all of us, right? Uh, you know, kind of the interior workings and, and things like that that we respond to. And, and just the notion that using art can trigger empathy, which is one, I'd say, of the highest human emotions um, that, we can, that we can exhibit. And to think that art can help unleash that in all of us is really encouraging. Mark, thank you for the opportunity to, 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 to be part of this conversation. And uh, uh, congratulations again on all the great work that, that you do and, and is conveyed to the world through these podcasts. Well, thank you. And listeners, thank you for being along for the ride. Thank you for supporting When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next week for the next episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.